The grouping of animals is widespread in the natural world and is seen all over Earth in a variety of different organisms. There is obviously some evolutionary benefit to living in a group because so many organisms do it. And one theory to this is the theory of kin selection. First, we need to consider the origins of kin selection theory. And to do that, we can look to Darwin. Darwin's On the Origin of Species presented his idea of natural selection. Natural selection is essentially the survival of the fittest. Those organisms that are best suited to their environment will go on to survive and, most importantly, reproduce. Darwin himself was particularly interested in why animals group together and was particularly concerned by eusocial insects, such as wasps, bees and ants. In some of these eusocial colonies, it will only be the queen that reproduces, while her siblings do not, who instead protect the nest and care for young. This certainly throws off Darwin's natural selection theory, as these organisms are not reproducing. Indeed, Darwin stated that eusocial insects were his one special difficulty, particularly because they cannot propagate their own kind. Why, when Darwin presents organisms as selfish beings intended to reproduce as much offspring as possible, do beings help each other at the expense of their own fitness? This is where the concept of altruism comes in. Altruism is an act that provides fitness benefits to one individual at a cost to another's fitness, and it occurs in nature all the time, although in less extreme forms than the eusocial insects. But how can altruism evolve when there is such a fitness cost? Well, Hamilton's rule, devised by Bill Hamilton, goes some way towards explaining that. The equation Rb greater than C essentially states how altruism can evolve. R is the relatedness between the performer and the receiver, C is the fitness cost to the performer, and B is the fitness benefit to the receiver. It essentially shows that helping behaviour can evolve when the indirect fitness benefits of aiding kin compensate the performer for any losses in personal reproduction incurred by altruistic behaviour. Relatedness is often expressed as something called the relatedness value. This is considered on a scale of 0 to 1, where 0 is completely unrelated and 1 is genetically identical. I share 100% of my genes with myself, so my relatedness value to myself is 1. My full sister shares roughly 50% of my genes, and so her relatedness value to me is 0.5. My grandchild shares about 25% of my genes, and so their relatedness value to me is 0.25. If I'm completely unrelated to someone, I share hardly any genes with them, and so their relatedness value is roughly naught. If I save two of my siblings, it would be just as good as saving myself, because I break even, genetically speaking. So I'm helping my relatives, I'm actually helping my own genes survive on into the next generation. But what does this look like in the real world? Some species of bees sacrifice themselves for others. If an enemy invades the nest, a worker may sting them to defend the colony, but dies in the process. Their direct reproductive capability is lost, but if their siblings survive to reproduce, their genes stand a good chance of surviving on into the next generation. This theory ties up nicely with inclusive fitness. Let's take a look at Paul. Paul can increase his reproductive success by having children himself, because he passes on his genes to them. This is called his direct fitness. But let's say Paul has a brother called Peter and that he has three children as well. Paul can also increase his reproductive success by aiding them, as they share his genes because of his sibling relationship. If Paul aids some of Peter's children, this is called his indirect fitness. It is important to remember here, though, that Paul's indirect fitness does not include all of Peter's offspring, only those that he helps. Paul's direct fitness, combined with his indirect fitness, multiplied by the relatedness value, pulled together to make his inclusive fitness. Inclusive fitness explains why an individual may aid another. In some situations, aiding your relatives may boost your reproductive success more than reproducing yourself. And our first case study of the Aloro parakeet determines why helping kin is so important. The Aloro parakeet is an endangered species of parrot endemic to several small fragmented habitats in Ecuador. They are one of the only known species of parrots to cooperatively breed. But why do they do this? Well, let's take a look at a breeding pair, which in one breeding season may produce three eggs, but due to environmental conditions and lack of protection at the nest, only two may survive. Once the chicks are hatched, only one of the breeding pair is able to successfully forage for food, so the chicks do not grow as big. 
As well as this, there is a risk in going off and breeding alone, so some of the breeding pair's offspring may choose to stay behind to help in the next breeding season. The original breeding pair now have another helper. Because of increased protection, three of the chicks that the breeding pair produce may now survive. As well as this, it is likely that more food will be successfully brought to the nest to allow the chicks to grow bigger. Because of inclusive fitness theory, the helper still has some reproductive success because she is aiding her close relatives, who share her genes. In fact, if two of our helper's siblings have children, that is as good as the helper having a child of her own, genetically speaking. In terms of Hamilton's rule, there are benefits and costs for the helper to staying at the nest to help their kin. Such benefits include increased protection. There may also be more food for the group, as there are more of them foraging. There is also the indirect fitness benefit of aiding kin. But then again, there are also costs, the most obvious of which is the helper forgoing their own reproduction. There is also an increased risk of disease in groups, as well as an increased risk of predation. However, if the benefits and relatedness outweigh the costs, altruistic behaviour can occur. For more information about kin selection, inclusive fitness, interesting journal articles about the subjects, and the papers discussed in this video, please see the links below. In the last video, we covered kin selection theory and why animals sometimes choose to live with and help kin. The obvious issue we run into here is how do organisms recognise their kin? It is clearly of evolutionary benefit to be able to know who you're related to, so that you're able to ensure that some of your genes, and not someone else's, are passed on. To do this, we're going to look at one particularly special microbe called Dictostelium. Dictostelium exists as a single-celled amoeba when food is plentiful. But when starved, the cells group together to become a multicellular slug. This migrates until it forms a fruiting body. The individual cells in the fruiting body become either dead altruistic stalk cells or live reproducing spore cells that survive to pass on genes. When dictostelium aggregates, it prefers to do so with kin, which are the cells that are most genetically similar to it. This is because if an individual ends up as a dead stalk cell, some of its genes are at least passed on through the surviving kin, which are spore cells. But of course, dictostelium need to be able to tell who kin are, and they do so by using immunoglobulin-like proteins which protrude out of their membranes. These act like little badges which tell other dictostelium what kind of strain they are. Different strains of dictostelium produce different badges. The tiger genes transcribe two such protruding proteins called TGRB1 and TGRC1 which act to recognise each other. TGRB1 on one cell acts to recognise TGRC1 on the other cell, enabling the two cells to stick together. If TGRB1 on one cell comes from the same strain as TGRC1 on the other, the cells can aggregate. If either one of the proteins were from a different strain, they cannot aggregate. The whole process works a little bit like a lock and key. If one cell has an orange lock and the other has an orange key, they can cooperate because they see each other as kin. However, if one has an orange lock and a green key, they don't cooperate. This image is from Chris Thompson's lab, which works on dictostelium. You can see that the two circles are two different strains of dicti, which have separated into two different kin groups because of the tiger gene. For more interesting ways in which kin can recognise each other, I've left some links below, which include green beard, phenotype matching, and environmental cues.